good afternoon all it's indeed a great pleasure for me to invite our next resource person dr rupasina ray and madam is a senior scientist and deputy head of infectious disease and immunology division of csir indian institute of chemical biology kolkata and the major research areas or research interest of madam is understanding virus assembly process and exploring normal biomarker molecular platforms for self assembly displaying viral proteins uh, viral like uh, virus like particles uh, vlps would be designed with an objective to make vaccine candidate or for the drug delivery exploring virus mediated horizontal gene transfer and its possible implications studying viral entry process and viral tropism and dissecting molecular interactions between viral proteins and host cell with an aim to design antiviral candidates currently the major uh, focus of the laboratory is dengue virus and the major credentials of uh, dr rubasna ray includes uh, madam is a member of royal society of biology uh, mr uh, sb 20 uh, 2018 onwards and uh, madam is ramalinga sami fellow 2017 uh, to present and also insa young scientist uh, ramanujan fellow indian institute of technology uh, karekur 2016 to 2017 and postdoctoral research uh, at national cancer institute national institute of health maryland uh, usa 2012 to 2015 and research associate at uh, indian institute of sciences bangalore 2011 to 2012 phd from indian institute of science bangalore during the period 2006 to 2011 and uh, madam is uh, already uh, received many uh, uh, large number of prestigious awards and uh, honors uh, madam is a member uh, having membership of indian national young academy of science insa ramalinga sami fellowship award from uh, department of biotechnology madam received then also received a full membership of uh, owsd organization for women in science in the developing world 2016 uh, received res research support for insa young scientist medal award indian national science academy insa 2016 then ramanujan fellowship award of uh, science and uh, engineering uh, research board serb dsc in 2015 insa medal for young scientist indian national science academy insa 2015 federal technology uh, transfer award of center for cancer research national institute of health nih 2014 and uh, fellows award for research excellence national institute of uh, health 2013 visiting fellowship national cancer institute nis 2012 travel award for international center of genetic engineering and biotechnology uh, workshop uh, uh, on human rna virus in 2010 best pop post award uh, and uh, also received uh, cscr jrf and also credit certificate for international competition for schools so uh, madam is having a large number of uh, publications in uh, highly reputed uh, journals with these introductory words i uh, request madam to uh, initiate the talk uh thank you so much uh, for inviting me here and it's my pleasure to uh, uh, talk here for uh, the students particularly so right now i'm keeping my camera off maybe later on i can turn it on because of internet uh, problems uh, so i'm going to share my slide and once uh, you see it just uh, let me know is my presentation uh, visible yes sir yes. yes yes please okay. so um yeah so uh today um, you know i am a virologist and uh, my uh, area of work is uh, virus uh, host protein and uh, uh, viral protein uh, interaction studies and uh, studying uh, viral self assembly process because viral proteins uh, have a tendency to assemble themselves uh, and uh, that uh, principle we use uh, to uh, uh, design a number of therapeutics like vaccine candidates uh, so that's why vlp vaccines i'll be talking about today uh, so i thank you once again for uh, that generous uh, introduction uh, 
So since there are students here, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, to give uh, a very brief outline about uh, vaccines and uh, what are the different types of vaccines. And uh, then I'll come to uh, a particular project that I uh, worked on and uh, to tell you uh, how VLPs as such uh, are made. Um, so uh, that uh, project uh, involves a uh, vaccine development, a VLP-based vaccine development. Okay, uh, sorry about that. I'm going to share now. Uh... So my slide is moving. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Sorry about it. Okay, so as I was saying, uh, there are three major roles a vaccine candidate uh, should uh, be able to accomplish. Uh, so the first one is to recognize a foreign object or a pathogen as a pathogen, destroy it for the time being, and also remember it as foreign because that memory is very important for our immune system. Because uh, next time you get infected with this pathogen, uh, our immune system should be able to recognize it. Uh, so that's where the memory comes from. And then again, destroy it. Now, uh, a vaccine can be made uh, from, uh, from various sources or there can be different uh, types of vaccines. So if I, I'll be talking more uh, in terms of a virus because I'm a virologist, but more or less this concept is true for other types of uh, pathogens as well. So if I have a virus here, our pathogen, uh, a virus uh, or a pathogen uh, is, is uh, by definition, we call, do not call a virus as, a, as an organism, but uh, uh, let's just start calling it as a pathogen. So it can be bacteria, it can be virus, uh, it can be a fungus or uh, some other pa uh, pathogen types. So you can use the entire pathogen uh, as uh, a vaccine candidate, but you cannot use that as uh, in, in its pathogenic form. You have to make it uh, non-pathogenic. So the entire pathogen can be used. You can use um, uh, the proteins uh, of that uh, pathogen. Uh, there are different types of proteins. I'll come to that. Then uh, you can use the nucleic acid or the genetic material, which can be DNA or RNA. Uh, or if it's an RNA, you can use the DNA form of it or the RNA form of it and vice versa. Then also uh, the pathogen infected cells uh, can be used. So uh, when I talk about protein, uh, again, uh, you can use it as a whole protein. The entire protein can be used uh, as an immunogen. Uh, you can use uh, different domains or even peptides out of it. 
Okay, so today I'll be talking more uh, something uh, which lies uh, somewhere uh, in between the entire pathogen and the subunits. So uh, it's a virus-like particle. Uh, so as I already described, uh, uh, there are uh, different types of vaccines based upon what I uh, uh, explained it to you. And you can ask me if there is any uh, doubt in it, uh, particularly the students at the end of the presentation. So uh, majorly, uh, the vaccines can be divided into uh, these many types. It can be inactivated whole organism vaccine, live attenuated whole organism vaccine, then protein subunits, virus-like particles, virus vectors, uh, mRNA or DNA. So now inactivated live attenuated uh, types will fall under uh, uh, a subcategory called as uh, the whole organism vaccine because the entire uh, virus has been used here. It is either killed or it is attenuated. Uh, by attenuation, you mean that you are making uh, the virus to grow uh, in uh, its, um, not in its natural host, but in some other host. Uh, and then uh, the virus accumulates or the pathogen accumulates uh, uh, genetic changes and it's able to survive in its new host now. So in that form, now you take it back and put it into its original host. Uh, we call it uh, as attenuated because this form of the pathogen uh, now cannot cause disease, but can uh, slowly replicate inside its uh, original host. Uh, then, uh, so the virus-like particles, uh, for understanding it, we have to understand what is a virus. So a virus, we all know, is, uh, it causes disease uh, in layman's term. It might not cause a disease, but uh, in layman's term, if I explain, it's a, um, it's, it's a particle. It's a particle, a uh, proteinaceous particle having uh, genetic uh, material, which can be DNA or RNA. Uh, and it is able uh, to infect a host. And in the host, it causes, uh, it replicates, and it might cause disease. So now this particle, it can be uh, only a proteinaceous particle, uh, which encapsulates inside the genetic material, which is uh, DNA or RNA. Again, it can be single-stranded DNA, it can be double-stranded DNA, circular or linear uh, single-stranded RNA or double-stranded RNA. Or it can be, uh, and this particular particle can either be uh, naked or it can be um, uh, enveloped. Uh, so when I say enveloped, uh, that means uh, there is a lipid uh, envelope on top of this proteinaceous shell and on this envelope there are there are viral viral proteins envelope proteins uh, embedded in there uh, so uh, likewise uh, the viruses can be categorized into two major types enveloped as well as non-enveloped viruses based upon the presence or the absence of the envelope so uh, so that was uh, the whole virus so if I want to generate a virus-like particle, I can use any of uh, these elements. Um, so either uh, the outer shell, the proteinaceous shell alone without the genetic material because we don't want uh, the virus to uh, cause the disease uh, because you want to use it as a vaccine candidate. You don't want your candidate to cause disease in humans. Uh, and you can also make uh, uh, VLPs, virus-like particles, uh, from uh, the envelope proteins because it will self-assemble into a uh, hollow shell without uh, either without uh, the uh, capsid inside or with the capsid. We call it as virus-like particle because it looks like uh, the native virus, although it cannot cause a disease. Uh, but the beauty of this platform is uh, the display of or uh, the kind of display of uh, the surface antigens. So it is in a high density repetitive manner. Um, and uh, this feature is important for eliciting a robust immune response. Uh, last but not, not the least, um, it is non-replicating in nature, so uh, it's safe to use. Now, uh, why this high density uh, display of surface antigens is important for um, the immune system? Uh, that is because uh, if you see these two panels, panel A and panel B, in panel A you have a B cell. Uh, if I'm sure you know that B cells are the cells which um, 
differentiate into plasma cells and plasma cells produce antibodies um, that we often hear of and which uh, provides you the immune uh, uh, protection. So B cells uh, have uh, these uh, B cell receptors which are uh, uh, antibodies on top of it. Uh, plasma cells secrete antibody on uh, the uh, pl plasma cells secrete antibody and uh, B cells have um, these, uh, they, so these uh, before getting secreted out, they are displayed on the membrane. So we also call these as a B cell receptors. So these B cell receptors uh, are the antibodies uh, bind to uh, their antigens from the pathogen. So if there are a lot of uh, antigens displayed on top of a vaccine platform in blue, uh, you can see uh, the VLP and the antigens are in yellow displayed on top of it. So if uh, there are many of these antigens on top of uh, the matrix. You can uh, see that a one uh, single uh, receptor can bind uh, to multiple um, antigens, right? But if you see in the bottom panel, you have fewer uh, antigens on top of the matrix. Uh, so here, uh, however, the B, since there are few, fewer uh, antigens on top of the matrix, B cell uh, receptors uh, can bind only a uh, few of uh, these uh, antigens. So that explains why a high density repetitive display is important. Now, uh, we often hear uh, and we read uh, when uh, we read immunology books, we see that it's written that our immune system gets educated right away, uh, uh, you know, uh, right in the beginning uh, when it's getting developed that uh, you should not recognize your own antigens uh, as foreign so we do not uh, respond to self antigens so that's the property of the immune system we don't respond to self proteins uh, but uh, researchers have observed that if your own protein you take and display it uh, in high density repetitive manner on a matrix now the body uh, can uh, recognize it as foreign and respond to it. So that's where it crosses the threshold of self-tolerance. And that is the principle we use um, in virus-like particles. Now, I have been fortunate enough to work with a group um, at National Institutes of Health, uh, Maryland with uh, United States. Um, so uh, the lab uh, chief, uh, is um, Dr. John Schiller. So this lab uh, is the pioneer in the field of development of uh, human papilloma virus uh, vaccine. Now it's available uh, commercially as uh, Soberix and Gardasil. So uh, they use this virus-like particle-based uh, technique to develop this uh, HPV uh, prophylactic vaccine. So uh, how uh, the VLPs are made. Now, viruses are made of different types of proteins. There can be structural proteins, there can be non-structural proteins. The structural proteins form the outer shell of the virus. That's why we call it a structural protein, forms the structure of the virus. And then you have non-structural proteins, which play a role in uh, viral RNA translation um, or replication and other uh, important functions of the virus inside the host cell. Now, the structural proteins, they, uh, they come together, they assemble, they self-assemble without uh, being guided uh, by any external force. They can self-assemble and they can form uh, the viral uh, structure. So in case of HPV, there are two types of uh, structural proteins. L1, the major uh, capsid protein, uh, the capsid is uh, the uh, proteinaceous shell of a virus which encapsidates the genetic material. Uh, so these uh, L1 and L2 are the minor capsid proteins here. So the major and the minor capsid proteins assemble and they form the virus, uh, virus-like particle. So uh, this has been used as uh, the vaccine candidate uh, and later on licensed off different companies. Now, um, a virus has a genetic material. 
you can also uh, make your vnp encapsulate or uh, encapsulate inside uh, uh, nucleic acids but the size of the nucleic acid should be uh, similar to what the virus encapsulates inside naturally so that is important now uh, now i uh, let's move on to uh, the work that i'll be uh, discussing uh, to uh, explain how vlp vaccine is developed so here uh, we tried to develop a vaccine against a disease called as progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy it's a neurodegenerative brain disease work uh, we worked on developing a vlp based vaccine for um, a virus called as jc polyoma virus it's a type of double stranded dna virus uh, viruses uh, so this virus infects a uh, human brain and it causes demyelination uh, of uh, neurons and uh, it's a fatal uh, neurodegenerative brain disease there is no uh, therapy available uh, till date but it's very important uh, uh, because a lot of immunosuppressive uh, people they tend to get this disease uh, particularly if uh, there are people who are undergoing immunosuppressive drug treatments uh, because they have they have multiple sclerosis or they have to undergo certain kind of organ transplantation surgeries or other medical reasons for which they have to um, uh, take immunosuppressants or immunosuppressive drugs so in that case when the body undergoes immunosuppression since the brain already has less immune surveillance uh, this virus which is a natural habitant of uh, your system uh, will uh, get the opportunity to replicate inside and cause uh, this particular disease now as i was saying uh, and uh, you all missed it uh, i'll just uh, start with uh, the structure of uh, the polyoma virus uh, jcb how it looks like so that it's easier for you to follow up uh, the development process of this uh, vaccine. So uh, this virus has a proteinaceous shell or the capsid. Uh, and this capsid is made up of capsomers or we also call it, as, uh, call it as pentamers because each capsomer or pentamer is made up of five um, uh, protein subunits. And this particular protein in this case is BP1. VP1 is a major capsid protein. Uh, as the name suggests, it is the uh, most abundant protein on the surface of this virus. Uh, so uh, 72 of these capsomers come together and form the viral structure. And other than this major capsid protein, uh, we also have VP2 and VP3, the minor capsid proteins. Uh, these capsid proteins are not important uh, for uh, maintaining the structure of the virus as such, but these are important for uh, enabling the virus to gain entry, successful entry in the host cell. Now, uh, this is a brief outline of how uh, we make uh, VLPs. So uh, here, we are, I will be using two terminologies. Both come under the major uh, category of virus-like particle, but I will uh, use different term terminologies for you to understand it better. When I say pseudovirus, that means it is uh, a virus without the genetic material, but uh, it has uh, a plasmid DNA inside that uh, expresses a reporter. Okay, so that reporter is important because uh, this is the form of the virus that we use to measure the viral infection in the host cell. Because when this virus or the pseudovirus infects uh, the host cell, this particle will go inside, release the um, DNA inside, and the reporter protein, which can be luciferase or GFP, green fluorescent protein, or any other fluorescent protein, will express. And the expression of this uh, reporter uh, protein uh, will tell you whether successful viral entry has happened or not. And this is important to measure the neutralization, uh, neutralizing antibody titers later on. Okay, so that is pseudovirus. Now, when I just use the term virus-like particle, that means there is nothing inside. It's an empty shell. Now, to make uh, these particles, what we do is to codon modify uh, the uh, uh, the uh, expression uh, genes uh, for uh, the major capsid proteins and the minor capsid proteins in a 
mammalian uh, expression plasmid. Uh, we are using uh, mammalian expression plasmid because we'll be using mammalian cells to uh, make these particles. So uh, the VP1, VP2, and the VP3, uh, these are four transfected inside uh, 293 TT cells. So uh, I won't go into technical details of all these, but uh, this is a mammalian uh, cell line. So here uh, the plasmids express themselves and the proteins are uh, formed. And there are uh, multiple steps that we use to purify uh, these uh, virus particles. So we could likewise clone and assemble around uh, more than 20 different uh, variants of uh, this particular virus. Now, um, just uh, to tell you briefly about the different steps involved um, into a bit more detail. So I have just put in, uh, in a very generalized form here, the capsid protein. It can be any uh, anything. It can be VP1, VP2, or VP3. But essentially, it's a codon modified capsid protein plasmid, and then you have the reporter gene. If you want to make pseudovirus, you don't use reporter gene express expression plasmid if you are uh, only making VLPs. So you do a transfection, uh, and then inside uh, the cell, as I told you, these plasmids will express uh, themselves. Uh, proteins will be formed, and these proteins will assemble, self assemble. Uh, to form the virus particles. Now, um, there are steps for harvesting, uh, that is, lysing these uh, cells, mammalian cells, releasing the uh, viruses inside um, uh, to the uh, to our medium, and then um, that particular thing we call it as cell lysate, crude cell lysate. It has a lot of debris, so we want to we need to purify it further. To do that, uh, we use nucleases and um, ammonium sulfate. We used ammonium sulf sulfate to precipitate the particles down, but there are different uh, protocols available. Uh, and we do it in a uh, overnight uh, maturation step. So we keep the entire preparation in 37 degrees for overnight. Uh, and then um, we have enzymes in our uh, reaction, which will chew off all these um, uh, uh, those nucleic acids which are not getting uh, encapsulated inside and just dangling around here and there. So they are going to uh, clump the particles together. So we don't want it. So we chew it off. Uh, and then after that, we clarify uh, the preparation. So clarification means nothing but centrifuging it a um, uh, couple of times, washing it. And then uh, this is the most important step. That is uh, the density gradient ultra centrifugation uh, that we do uh, on top of uh, iodexanol. Uh, Optiprep opti uh, is another name for uh, the main chemical, which is iodexanol gradients. Uh, we have uh, three different uh, gradients uh, that are laid on top of each other. And at the topmost layer, uh, we put our uh, cell lysate and we let, uh, let it centrifuge for. A uh, few hours, uh, some four hours, uh, at uh, uh, lower temperature, and then we uh, pierce this tube. This is a polyalumer tube. We pierce uh, it at the bottom using a needle, and uh, collect the gradients, and then screen them by different uh, techniques um, to uh, purify the VLPs. Uh, and this is a transmission electron microscopy picture to show uh, that the VLPs were indeed assembled inside. So after this, we went ahead for uh, preclinical studies uh, in mice, um, because before going to humans, you always want to do uh, preclinical studies. So these uh, VLP vaccines, uh, vaccine candidate uh, uh, could uh, really, uh, I'm not discussing the results in detail, but uh, uh, what we did, we immunized Balsi mice. These are white uh, mouse. Um, and uh, there are two doses that we gave, the prime and the prime boost. So uh, the first and the second dose, in other words. And the end of the second dose, uh, we checked the neutralizing antibody levels. And we could see that uh, 
our vaccine could indeed generate very good neutralizing antibody response. So uh, we also went ahead uh, and we did a human trial. So this was a single uh, human trial or case study that we did. Um, for this, we collaborated with uh, uh, two different places uh, with uh, Dr. Paola Sinkwe at San Rafael Institute, Milan, Italy, and uh, Dr. Roland Martin at the University of Zurich. They are medical doctors, and uh, they helped us in doing this. So uh, a comatose uh, PML patient uh, who was destined to die, so there was no way uh, she could be rescued. Uh, so the family volunteered, uh, and we could uh, conduct uh, this clinical trial. Uh, this uh, lady was immunized with uh, the VLP vaccine and uh, was followed up by different means like MRI scans and uh, serum was collected at uh, different time points which we got in our laboratory and we tested uh, for the virus titer and the neutralizing antibody levels and uh, so this was done for uh, over a year time uh, the monitoring and you can see here different uh, types of MRIs have been done uh, again not going into the types of MRI uh, because that's out of scope of uh, this stuff uh, so what's important here to notice is that in the re red arrow mark is the point when the immunization was done. And you can see as uh, time progresses, uh, the white lesions uh, decrease uh, in volume. And uh, it is best uh, if you see the bottom panel, uh, the red panel, uh, where the yellow is uh, the lesion. And at the end, you can see in 2013, um, uh, there is no lesion. 2012. Uh, we started uh, the study in 2013. She was uh, free of the uh, PML lesion. So uh, we can conclude that um, JCV virus-like particle uh, vaccine uh, was profoundly immunogenic and it could uh, uh, induce neutralizing antibody or response. I have written here broadly neutralizing responses because we have conducted different types of studies and we could see that uh, the antibodies could neutralize different variants of this virus. So this uh, study was uh, published uh, in uh, Science Translation in Medicine and the patent was granted in 2018 uh, just before uh, the COVID-19 pandemic started uh, in October. 2019, it was licensed out to Biologic E Limited, a Hyderabad based company. So, I will uh, like to keep it uh, till here, uh, and uh, but I would like to acknowledge a few people uh, Dr. Christopher Buck, uh, Dr. John Schiller um, at NIH, then our collaborators, uh, Dr. Paula uh, Sinkwe and uh, Dr. Roland Martin. Um, these are my current laboratory members, and uh, Ms. Sweetie is a past member. So currently, I have four PhD students. Um, three are from this country. Uh, one uh, is from uh, Nigeria. He is a CSR to us uh, fellow, and uh, they are very bright students. So currently, we are working on various other uh, virus types using this technology, like SARS-CoV-2 and uh, dengue virus. Uh, and finally, I would like to thank uh, uh, the different funding uh, organizations uh, and particularly CSIR where I work. Um, IICB is my institute and uh, Indian National Science Academy. Uh, Sir DBT, West Bengal DST uh, for funding different uh, projects. Uh, then IMYAS is in the National Young Academy of Science. I'm a member of this academy and has been a great platform to interact with peers, Royal Society of Biology and the Organization for Women in Science for the Developing World. And with that, thank you so much for your patience and uh, I'll be happy to take if there is any question. Can you suggest the applicability of this for uh, managing viral diseases? <clears throat> Okay, uh, so yes, 
so as i already told you that uh, uh, this uh, this is uh, a technology that means it can be utilized to other viruses as well and when i started my presentation uh, with the work that i described today i already told that uh, uh, i worked in a uh, laboratory which worked on human papilloma virus so already this uh, technique has been used in case of human papilloma virus to develop uh, fda approved uh, vaccines uh, that are already there in the market uh, the gardasil and the cerberic so yes it is uh, uh, it has been used for hpv and it is also uh, been used for sars cov2 recently uh, and other many other viruses so people are already using it for different viruses madam when we use the vlp is it uh, likely that some of the other genes are, uh, can also get introduced into this one within the host is there any possibility uh, so uh, by other things i am not sure but uh, you are indicating if you can elaborate on that i can uh, throw more light on it uh, in, in your research interest we could see your uh, area of interest as uh, uh, virus mediated gene transfer and uh, such mechanism so is it uh, likely that uh, is, is there any possibilities that such mechanisms can be uh, uh, mediated through vlp also yes sure so similar uh, similar studies or similar platforms have been used by other groups where uh, you know definitely it has potential and they have used it for de delivering um, different genes if you want to use or you can use it in general as a drug delivery vehicle or a platform in different ways uh you can also use um uh, these structure of one virus to display viral pro and uh, the proteins from other pathogens or other viruses and uh, you can use this chimera as vaccines or you can uh, encapsulate uh, say if you want to introduce a, um, a dna uh, in the host cell to express something you can encapsulate it in virus like particle and throw it inside and whichever host cell this particular virus um, infects is supposed to infect now this particle will transduce or enter into that host cell and uh, the contents will be uh, released inside so it can be used as a target specific uh, delivery of uh, reagents as well madam can you suggest the uh, uh, fate of this one within a host or within a human or whatever it is but within the host what can be its fate or yeah so fate is nothing but so you are using this uh, to introduce certain antigens inside uh, the body so that's uh, what it does mostly it will go inside and um, uh, uh, it will be processed by proteasomes these are organelles inside uh, any host cell so it will be processed inside into peptides and these peptides will be presented by mhc class 1 molecules um so these are different immune uh, uh, molecules uh, if anyone wants to know i can tell otherwise i'll skip that but so it enters into the immunological pathway but uh, the particles as such uh, after some time will get uh, destroyed it has a half life it cannot be there forever but by the time it gets destroyed uh, the immune system is already educated about uh, this pathogen and uh, it is not required immediately but uh, to make sure that immune education is complete that is the reason we give booster dose as well so there is a prime dose there is a booster dose and sometimes a booster doses instead of two doses we also get three doses so uh, that's how it works madam how the uh, specificity component will be uh, selected here specificity in the sense specific uh, specificity for of the virus uh, to a specific part of the body or tropism or receptor specificity yes so um, it depends upon what type of antigens are displayed on top of it if you are using uh, if you are developing a vlp using uh, the structural proteins of one single virus then that particle will enter the host cells that Uh, the original virus is supposed to infect um however uh, if you are just introducing something from uh, some other pathogen which is encapsulated inside this particle but um uh, uh, the target host cell is different 
in that case again uh, the entry will be mediated or guided only by the structural proteins that are there on top of the VLPs. So uh, whichever uh, virus is the origin of the structural proteins uh, of the VLP will guide you uh, with the host cell. So that host cell will be used. But is it possible that we can include uh, antigen specific to more viruses? That means particular gene specific to more viruses in a VLP, or can we have any sort of a limitation, size limitation in the number of uh, genes or that can be introduced into the system? Uh, I am not sure what uh, is the question. If you can repeat the question once more. Madam, is it possible that, uh, for example, if we can uh, design a VLP, which deliver a particular envelope antigen of uh, COVID-19. And at the same time, can we in incorporate some antigen of uh, like uh, influenza virus? So is it possible that multiple uh, genes corresponding to multiple uh, different antigens of uh, different viruses can be, is it possible to incorporate in the same VLP? Yes, it is possible. VLPs can be engineered in many ways. So it all depends what is uh, your agenda. So what are you targeting? So accordingly, you can make your view.